kind of issued, issued leases yet, and we're approaching that leasing stage. So you think about if we're away from a leasing process, um, well, it really depends. And I hate to sound like this, oh, I really can't give you an answer. But we're getting ready now to do that area identification. Once we have that made, the comment period for the call closes in March. It'll take several months to, to uh, take a look and crunch the comments that we receive to develop this area identification, to work with the Commonwealth and the stakeholders about how the decision is being made, to get the bureaucratic you know, blessing from our, our secretary, our director, et cetera. So we'll probably be ready to start on an, on an EA in the next several months. That EA on an area, again, depending on the configuration, it always comes down when you do impact analysis, whether it's an EIS, a full-blown EIS, or an environmental assessment. It always comes down to where you are and what is there. So I hate to give a prediction as to how long it will take to do an EA. And we also have consultations with the, I'm doing all the caveats because I'm a good fed and I don't want to um, under, undercut this. And I appreciate the fact that people want to move through this but it depends on the consultations with the tribes with regard to uh, Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act, as well as protected species. But you could probably do an environmental assessment in this area to do the consultations anywhere between 10 and 14 months. That's my guess. This is a guess without having the area specifically identified, knowing what kind of requirements you may need to do Then, if it ends up being competition, you add another several months to uh, have the uh, resale auction underway, and then we can become a little more predictable. It may be, you know, let's say three years to collect your site data, to collect your bird data, your marine mammal data, to the level that you have those resource agencies comfortable. Then they file their construction operation plan, where you do an EIS, and I'll just use around, it'll take anywhere between 18 to 24 months to complete the consultations and the analytics, because then now you're talking about construction where there's likely to be more potential impacts to resources, physical, biological, and social economic. So let's say 18 to 24 months to really do that. Once they complete their construction operation plan, if we approve it or approve it with the conditions, it's a matter of when, when the orders for the turbines and the installation and all that can take place. So you guess maybe perhaps, oh, you know, I don't know, 12 months after the completion and approval of the construction operation plan, that perhaps they can start constructing but again, it really depends on the types of machines that are going to be used, the availability of those machines at the time, the kinds of issues that we uncover in the, in the front end with the EA, at the construction operation stage with the EIS. I mean, you always hope for the smoothest sailing. I think that we've set ourselves up quite well because we are having the dialogue with everyone. So hopefully there won't be those un unexpected impact uh, being revealed in an environmental assessment or in a construction operation plan. So I can't tell you it's going to be you know, five years from today, but I can tell you that we're going to be working hard to make sure that we're effective and efficient with our time. So we're not you know, um, just gratuitously having notices and meetings that we're really truly trying to get to real issues, do that analysis, and move forward. So the bad news is I can't give you a date, but the good news is I can assure you that we will be efficient with our time to, to arrive at you know, a final uh, ribbon cutting for a facility in the most efficient manner and timing possible. Um, so. Yes, I, my name is Carolyn Bick. I'm from uh, WCAI. And I actually had a question that kind of goes back to the beginning-ish of your slideshow. Um, what makes something suitable to be released into a marine environment? And then also along those lines, uh, what constitutes no significant impact, uh, specifically to the wildlife in the area? Um, with regards to the whales that we were talking about before. What was your first question? What is considered suitable? I'm sorry, suitable to be released into the marine environment? I guess I'm trying to figure out the context in the beginning of the presentation with regard to your first question. Um, you know, when we do an impact analysis, and we're taking a look at this scenario associated with the number of vessel trips for, to conduct the seismic or the survey. Uh, data collection efforts. We take a look at developing the scenario associated with the uh, noise level when you in place a meteorological tower. We take a look at what does that mean with regards to the impacts. We have to take a look at the health and the status of a particular biological system. If it's, if it's the right whale, obviously that is a highly sensitive uh, protected species.
species. And so when we take a look at altering the feeding pattern, the migration pattern, the, the definition of significance is it's much more sensitive. It's easier to reach that lower significance. If you're taking a look at something like seagrass beds, something that is protected and very, very important because of the, the value that it plays in the ecosystem, that level of what is defined as significance, again, is, is very sensitive. If you're taking a look at a biological resource that happens to be prevalent all over um, this call area, that can sustain perhaps some temporary localized effect and will come back into the area. That definition of what significant is, is something that is, is a little, not as sensitive as a right whale or a seagrass bed. So really there's no pat answer to how you, how you define significance. You have to take a look at it at a resource to resource basis. I'll use another example that's not biological. When you're talking about protecting pre-contact sites, you know, any kind of disturbance is considered significant. So you cannot have a disturbance has to be avoided. So that's a very clear, <coughs> easy way to describe what a significant impact to be. There should be no impact. Brian, would you want to um, add with regard to um, definition of significant impacts or, or suitability? And yeah, I, I, I think we've covered it pretty well. Um, uh, one of our, our main mitigation measures is avoidance. So uh, as Mo said, with pre-contact sites and also with things like shipwrecks and other uh, underwater archaeological sites, um, we have cert we'll have certain provisions that will be spelled out in the EA and in the lease, I believe, which will talk about how how much of a distance you have to have before you can put anything like a Met Tower, Met Buoy, or do um, geophysical surveys um, near any any of those kind of sites out there. So we do have those provisions which we'll, we will use. But then, how, how does it? How do? What, what species would take precedence then? If we could just have a short answer. Here. Sorry, I'll be as short as I can. Well, obviously, you have certain species that are listed. And so those would, we would take the more critical look at, not critical again, we're more sensitive to what kinds of things can alter their behavioral patterns. Okay. And that's really easy because we have those listed species. Then we take a look at um, those uh, species that are not listed. We have micro, oh, well, I guess that maybe what I should say is there's protected species in various um, hierarchy. Endangered species, then you have migratory birds, you have marine mammals, and we take a look at those from the sense of uh, working very closely with those trust resource agencies such as the National Fishery Service and Fish and Wildlife Service, as well as the state agencies that also help in, in protection and data gathering. So I would say that you know when they're listed, those are a particular sensitivity in making sure that whatever disruption is, is minimized or a fine set avoided. So that's where that's not to Just very briefly, just wanted to thank everybody for coming out. Well, they always say uh, an important romantic night for many of you. <laughs> so uh, I also wanted to say, I mean, some of the most substantive and uh, thoughtful comments that we have received, and I know our federal law department is very much probably value uh, this conversation. So we will be back in touch with you probably in the spring or early summer. And uh, enjoy the night, and thank you to our federal friends. Appreciate it.